Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're at in the country. This is Curtis Hawks, Chief Marketing Officer over here at Insurance Agency Marketing Services. And I appreciate everybody taking some time uh, out of their day to be with us today. Um, this is going to be part two of our training series on running virtual preset appointments uh, within the Sterling Appointment Program. Um, I know we've got uh, a mix of agents on the call today, those that are actually doing the program. And I know we've got some people that are maybe looking at, at this. And so I wanted to take a, a couple of minutes before we get into that deep dive and chat about some of the additional resources that IMS has available. Um, first up, let me get over here, uh, is our new producer builders. And so that's a, a very effective way to uh, as, a, as a new producer with IMS to uh, have us help partner with you, uh, whether it's on marketing or marketing programs or cash or trips or what have you, you can see a variety of different point levels there uh, that you can cash in at. And I would encourage anybody that has questions on that to certainly feel free to reach out, talk to one of our sales directors over here, phone number is 800-255-5055. In addition to that, we've got a referred producer program. Uh, if you know of an agent that you think might be a fit over here or maybe isn't quite happy where they're currently at, not only do you get a $50 bonus uh, when the agent first gets contracted, but on an ongoing basis, uh, you'll receive uh, additional income off of their production. You don't have to do anything. We'll take care of all of the service. And those checks come out on a quarterly basis. And those are honestly some of the biggest checks that we cut. So if you, if you know somebody that might be in transition, definitely reach out and talk to a sales director. Uh, and, and, and let us know. In addition to that, we've got our marketing reimbursement program. Uh, when you write business with IMES, you'll get an additional $100 for every 100,000 of qualifying index annuity premium, and an additional $200 for every 100,000 of single premium life premium or 10,000 of life target. Uh, back office support. Uh, you know, I think this has really had a spotlight on it here over the last couple of years as carriers have gone remote or uh, been trying to expand staff, what have you. Uh, I, I think it's really put a spotlight on the importance of dealing uh, with an IMO that's strong on a service standpoint, whether it's on the front end with case design and illustrations and getting applications out to you to processing new business, commission tracking, et cetera. And so I think we do it better than most. And I would, I would encourage everyone, if you haven't had a chance to uh, test out our, our service, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, in addition, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today as well, um, but IMS is very focused on technology. Uh, we do integrate with Firelight. <clears throat> we also integrate with iPipeline uh, for more of your traditional life insurance companies. Uh, you can see a mix of the carriers here that we have on Firelight. But eApps, I, I think, have grown uh, to be critically important in the sales process, especially in the world of virtual appointments. Uh, a lot of the individuals that you might meet with want to just do an e-application right there. And so the ability to have access to those through our site uh, at the click of a button, uh, you know, is all designed to help make doing business easier. And so if you've got questions um, on that or want to know how to get registered on it, certainly feel free to reach out and talk to a sales director over here. Uh, in addition to that, we've got our creative marketing solutions. Uh, today, obviously, we're going to be talking about one of our marketing programs that we have available to advisors. But, uh, you know, I do think creative is the key word. Uh, we, we strive very diligently to have a whole portfolio of different options available uh, for our reps uh, because there's not one silver bullet out there. And, and so a, a big component of that is figuring out what that right mix of marketing strategies is for you. In fact, I'll, I'm going to launch our first poll of the day, but one of the, the ways that we make sure that we're getting you matched up with the right program is we do provide a complimentary marketing analysis uh, to our licensed agents. And what that entails is we'll actually sit down with you, go through who your target market is, uh, what are your marketing assets currently, what does the business look like currently, what do you want it to look like, and then we'll put together uh, a complete marketing plan that details out here's the different things from brand awareness to direct lead generation that we think you should take a look at. And so right now, you know, we're we're in the first quarter, um, you know, with the second quarter not that far away. It's a great time <clears throat> to sit down, go through that, and uh, look at any adjustments or modifications that you might need uh, to make. And if you're not currently doing a sterling program, see if that might be a fit for you as well. So. 
I'll go ahead and uh, close this down and then we'll keep moving along here. Um, as I mentioned, uh, technology is a big focus of ours. So our IAMS website, uh, we've really worked diligently to make that be a, a resource for our advisors from quoting software on both the life and the annuity side to being able to download forms or do e-applications. We've got our sales resource library on there, uh, which has literally hundreds of point of sale pieces that you can instantly download. So a wealth of resources uh, available on there. And the nice thing is you just have to be contracted to get access to it. So if you're not currently contracted, um, you reach out, talk to a sales director, they can help you with that but just a variety of different tools and pieces on there to help uh, support business. Uh, in addition to that, um, we do integrate with a couple of different uh, software platforms. One of those being is uh, Retirement Analyzer. And we've really seen an increase in the use of these types of platforms, especially in the virtual uh, appointment process. The ability to take a concept of, am I gonna outlive my income in retirement? or uh, how much am I gonna lose of my retirement income when it comes to taxation? Being able to show that visually and in a simple and straightforward matter, or manner has become critically important. And so um, we've made sure to incorporate different software platforms that allow you to uh, articulate that narrative and uh, show clients you know, with their own money what things will look like and, and the risks in retirement. And so you can get access to Retirement Analyzer on any of our software platforms um, for free through IMS. You just need to reach out and talk to a sales director over here and they can help you with that. Uh, in addition to that, <clears throat> um, you know, IMS uh, built out a few years ago, an RIA, IMS Wealth Management. And we did that because part of what we've seen uh, is there is there's a general trend that's that's certainly been accelerating to uh, being able to offer AUM within your practice. And so, you know, right now is a, uh, a good a time as any. Uh, in fact, I, I think we have seen significant growth over the last couple of years with advisors um, taking the opportunity to go out, get their test, et cetera. And so if you've, if you've ever thought about that, if you have questions on it, reach out, talk to Duncan, Charles. Uh, they, they do a great job and they can talk to you a little bit about uh, service, investments uh, that are available and, and how they work with advisors. Uh, in addition to that, I uh, did want to mention our, our top producer summit. Uh, we still have time to qualify for that. Uh, qualification runs through June, June 30th and it really is going to be a high-end concierge level trip. Uh, you know, we're really excited to be able to, to offer this. Um, and so I would encourage everybody, if you have questions about where you rank and if you're going to qualify, reach out, talk to one of the sales directors over here, and they can help you with that. Um, in addition to that, we've got our Life and Annuity Academy. Um, our first uh, event of the year is actually coming up April 6th through the 8th. And this is really a great opportunity to spend some time working on your business. Uh, we bring out, as you can see up there, number of top producers, um, have a lot of presenters on different marketing ideas, prospecting ideas, sales strategies, et cetera. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and launch our next poll here, but it's, it's just a great opportunity to get out of the office. Uh, you know, when we're out in the field, we're in the business, we're focusing on that. It's a great opportunity to work on your business and see what are trends that you need to be aware of? What are marketing ideas you need to be aware of? What are strategies based off of what's going on in the marketplace that you should be incorporating into your business? And then hear from other top producers. Um, I think another big uh, point on this as well is there's something to be said about not just what's going on on, on stage, but the other advisors that are there. It's a great way to network, share ideas, uh, et cetera. And so we're, uh, wrapping up uh, registration for that this week, uh, since we're about a month out. So uh, still a little bit of time to get in on that. Um, and, and certainly if you have interest, uh, check yes on the box there. And I'm going to go ahead and get this closed down here so we can keep moving along. All right. Uh, lastly, before we get into the main presentation, uh, make sure to follow and like us on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook and LinkedIn but we do a uh, lot of content syndication on there, whether it's events coming up or 
uh, rates, new product information, marketing ideas, you name it. And so it's a, it's a great way to uh, get that consistent flow of information that you need. So with that, um, moving on to the main presentation, uh, the I'm Sterling Appointment Program. This is part two of our three-part series. And uh, for those of you, I, I know we've got, a, as I mentioned, a mix of advisors on here. Uh, for those of you that aren't necessarily aware of the Sterling Appointment Program, this is a virtual preset appointment program that targets a few different target markets from K through 12 educators, uh, colleges and universities, as well as state municipal employees. And uh, the way the program works is it's virtual preset appointments with individuals uh, that have questions on a variety of things, whether it's on their retirement accounts or the impact of taxation on their income or social security, or even are they gonna run out of money? And so one thing that you know we learned a long time ago is everybody has a sales process. You have to have a sales process in this business. But one thing that we all have to be cognizant of is within our sales process, how are we getting in front of those prospects? And what does that entry point look like? And then do we have to make adjustments to what we're doing based off of the entry point of that prospect? And I'll give you an example of that. Um, let's say as an example, you're doing seminars. Well, the way that you might follow up with somebody that came, sat, watched you for an hour present and requested an appointment with you, the way that you might follow up with that person probably looks a little bit different than if you'd done a direct mail drop and got a response card in, right? How you're gonna interact with that individual is gonna look a little bit different. And so that's part of what we're wanting to go through here in this training series is best practices in these appointments to put you in the, the best position to have success and close as much business as possible. And so with me today is Scott Bell. He's the president of Sterling National Financial Group. He has um, been doing this, generating appointments, training advisors for over 20 years. Um, and so I asked him to be uh, on this with me. And so we've got a series of questions of, of common things that come up um, you know, in between the first and second appointment into the second appointment that we're going to cover today. So, Scott, I appreciate you taking some time with us today. Thank you, Curtis. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So, um, before getting into the second appointment, let's talk about, in the, in the last training, we talked about what needs to happen in the first appointment. So, in between the first appointment and the second appointment, um, we know with the Sterling platform, there's follow-up that's done. Um, there's reminders that'll go out to an individual uh, on their appointment out to that consumer. But should there be any correspondence with the advisor and that prospect after that initial meeting uh, before the second one's uh, set? And if so, any suggestions on correspondence or what they might take a look at doing? Sure. So, um, you know, there's always questions that come up or that can't come up between the first and second appointment. And, um, you know, the good, the good thing to do is to open up the lines of communication. Um, you know, nowadays text messaging has become so common and so easy that um, and most of the time people can do it while they're at work um, without any problems. That That's most likely the, the best way to communicate. That's when we have service calls come into our practice and uh, clients of mine that I have to service, that's usually how we communicate with them is through text messages. So um, if you can establish that from the beginning, um, the great thing about text message is it takes the emotion out of it. Uh, the bad part about text message is it does take the emotion out of it. So you need to keep it really simple. The last thing you want to do, though, is to send them any information about the current products or about interest rates or anything by that style of communication, whether it's email or text messages before the second appointment. Make sure that if they have questions about products, if they have questions about um, you know, taxation or anything like that, that you always defer those questions to the second appointment. So really the correspondence between the first and second appointment should only be about items that they need to generate. So like if they have questions about, well, you know, I had a 401k, but I can't find it. So maybe give them suggestions on how to go find the, the, the paperwork for a 401k so you can look at the, uh, the uh, statements. Or, or um, you know, I can't meet at Thursday at three o'clock, can we meet Friday at three o'clock? So changing the appointment time and things of that nature. If they start asking you questions that you need to truly explain or sell, I would try to defer all those conversations to the second appointment. Uh, so that way you have their undivided attention and you don't get hit with any kind of pit stops, if you know what I mean. All, all good points. I mean, that's a, a, at the end of the day, if, if 
if if you're answering all the questions in between the first and the second appointment, there's not a big reason for them to be on the second appointment. Exactly. Okay. So in regard to the second appointment, so initially when the first meeting set up, it's scheduled as a phone call. And so on the second appointment, should the agent be trying to schedule another phone call or transitioning to Zoom? So no matter what, um, you need to obviously gauge the um, comfortability of, your, of, the, of the lead. So if they're adverse to doing a Zoom for the second meeting, obviously don't push that on them. But if they're okay with doing a Zoom meeting for the second appointment, I would, I would highly suggest you do that. And the reason being is because most people are visual buyers. And so it gives you the chance to show them um, you know, items that you have prepared for them, whether it's your track analysis or retirement analysis or whatever the case might be, it gives you a chance to show them items. Plus, if you are gonna take the second, if you're gonna take an application in the second appointment, you can do that through Zoom. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So a, a, a follow-up to that question uh, then, Scott, is a big core reason for Zoom is so that way, whether it's an illustration or an income presentation, whatever it might be, you can put that up on the screen in front of them because we're not wanting to just email that out, correct? We're, we're wanting them to be able to have to come to the second appointment to see all of that, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, basically in the second appointment, you have prepared um, you know, either a retirement uh, income analysis or something of nature for them. And so Zoom gives you a chance to illustrate that for them. Also for me, but back before Zoom, you know, I always scribbled on a yellow notepad and even with Zoom, you know, you can pull up Notepad and still draw things to them. This gives you a chance to make sure that you're capturing their attention and drawing attention to the things that you need for them to pay attention to, to obviously make the sale. So, um, you know, becoming very fluid and, um, uh, you know, very accomplished at Zoom is very important to make sure that you're not fumbling through it so you lose their attention. Okay. So next question is, should the spouse be at the second appointment? G generally speaking, that initial appointment is gonna be set with that individual, that educator, that state employee, et cetera. So it, it's gonna be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, should you be telling, the per telling that person if they're married, they need to have their spouse on the second meeting or can you give us some context around that? Sure, so this is always the tricky one and I get asked this question a lot. Um, you know. There are times when I have been personally meeting with clients and um, with the spouse has come up, they very adamantly said that they don't want their spouse involved. Um, and then obviously the, the reverse has happened. Well, I don't make a decision without my spouse being involved. So you as a, you as a sales professional are going to have to gauge that. Uh, if they brought up their spouse in the, in the presentation leading up to the second meeting, then I would throw it out there that, you know, if you want your spouse to be available, then that's great. Um, for some people, that's a turnoff because they view their retirement as their thing and their spouse's retirement as their thing. And so don't always assume that everyone does things, that spouses do things together. There are what we call duplex marriages, which is, you know, there's one side, one house, and the other side of their house. And so there are a lot of people that are like that. I think that, um, the younger generation, we're finding that to become a lot more, that uh, their retirements are kept separate. And so don't just assume that the spouse wants to be involved. Um, obviously, if you can get the spouse involved and if they brought up the spouse during the presentation, I think it's important that you get them on. So that way you're not doing what we call a peg leg sale. In other words, you have both decision makers um, on the line in front of you. Um, but, you know, obviously you have to make sure and set that up properly. So. As you go through the first appointment, if you've only met with one of the spouse and for the second appointment, if the, both of them are there, you need to make sure during that second appointment to introduce yourself, to gain credibility with that spouse because they didn't have the benefit of listening to you on the first appointment. So make sure and take it slow on the second appointment because you might have gained the trust of the, the initial lead that you spoke to, but you also need to gain the trust of their spouse. All, all very good points. And so, you know, I think one of the, the key takeaways there is is, is they're gonna drive that if, if they're asking questions about having the spouse on, et cetera. That's right. All right. So 
pension income. That's going to be a topic that comes up on every every appointment that you are going to end up generating. That individual component of that is what is my income number, and I think one one of the the, the challenges is, is if you don't understand how to talk about it and how to uh, incorporate that into the an overall you know their overall financial plan their budget, then what can end up happening is you might feel like okay I went generated you know what their income amount is and it was like that's all the person wanted to know they just want to know what the income number is. So uh, Scott, can you talk a little bit about how how that needs to be framed when you're talking about the income number, um, you know, off of whether it's their state retirement system or their 403B or 457 or, or what have you. You bet. So um, a lot of mistakes that I, that I see advisors make on this is they don't have the uh, cost of living adjustment or the um, or inflation um, conversation at the beginning of this. So really, what you should do is you say, okay. Bread, butter, and milk are going to get more and more expensive as we get, you know, think about how much a car cost 20 years ago compared to how much is it today. But we're just going to look at today's dollars. And it's very important that you make that clear because sometimes you can show a big number that that um, illustrates inflation and they think, gosh, you know, I can live off that. But they're not taking into consideration that, um, that their cost of goods and services are going to go up that same amount. So making sure and having the conversation about, hey, we're just gonna talk about today's dollars right now at the very beginning will help out tremendously. So that's how I would start and frame it, frame the conversation. Okay. From there also what you need to do is you need to kind of get rid of the myth that when people retire that all of a sudden that they um, don't have near as much expenses because that honestly just isn't true. Um, you know, I've been in this business a long time, worked with a lot of people who retired and yes, they're, you know, it's very possible that your expenses can go down when you retire, but you shouldn't be counting on it for a way to live. Um, in other words, you might not be paying tolls every day to get to drive to work, but you're still going to have to eat every day. There's still things that you're going to do to, um, you know, to take up your time. So, uh, again, I would I would take care of that myth right from the beginning also. The third thing I would do, go ahead, Curtis. I was going to say those are those are all really good points. In fact, I I, I have an advisor, and what he'll he'll ask somebody when he's trying to have that expense conversation because because you, you're right, people have the misconception that they're going to spend less in retirement, and he'll ask the question of well, what day of the week do you do you spend the most money? And so the response is usually the weekend, you know, Saturday, Sunday, for you know something like that. His response to that is, well, when you retired, every day Saturday. And so don't make that mistake that, you know, you're going to all of a sudden have less expenses. So anyways, not to interrupt, but yet yeah, very good oh, no. point. That's a great point. So also what I would do is make sure during this discussion to have some kind of visual aid. So um, whether it's the retirement analysis kit, whether it's um, retirement analyzer, track software, whatever you might use, uh, make sure that you have something put together that shows what their current income is and then what, what it'll drop to once they retire. Visually, that helps them understand what the gap can be. Now, on the flip side of that, if someone hasn't saved any money, they started working very late, late in life, you know, don't kick them in the teeth by showing them just an you know, astronomical number. Uh, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna pop their bubble and you're going to you know, turn them off and they're gonna wanna get off the phone with you. So if their retirement income um, is if the disparity disparity before when they're going to retire versus what they're going to get is just way way off. Make sure and hide that slide from them so that again you don't discourage them so much they just like well this just isn't worth it and they get off the uh, they get off the appointment with you. So make sure that what you're showing them is realistic and that they can do it and that you have to be positive about that so that you they can they can feel that energy from you. Yep. So one question that commonly comes up is, where do I find the person's income number? And where do I go? They, they want to know how much, you know, they've been working for X amount of years. And they want to know what's my income number right now. Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe some different places that you can go or how to go search and find that in, in your local state? 
Yeah, so uh, the best way to find that is to use a software program. But if you don't have that available to you, um, then what you can do is you can go to the state retirement systems. They usually have calculations that are on there. You can read up about them. I would suggest that if you're going to do this, that you have to be an expert on the state retirement systems. Um, you know, it's it's very important. Everything from, you know, people have taken years of service out, which a lot of people have done. You need to know how to buy those years of service back. Um, you need to know, you know, how the taxation works with it. Um, you know, all the different rules and, and regulations that go along with the state retirement plan are very important for you to know. Um, if, if you're really tr truly looking at trying to do an illustration, then I would strongly suggest using uh, the retirement the, uh, the retirement analysis kit, which is called, we call it TRAK, T-R-A-K. It's um, produced by a company called Retire Ready. And um, if you are licensed with National Life Group and our producer, then you can get that. The National Life Group will actually pay for that software for you. Um, so it's actually very good software. It does all kinds of things like the, it finds out the uh, retirement uh, gap of what they're you know, gonna, gonna get from retirement, state retirement versus what they have. It includes Roth 403Bs, it includes Roth IRAs. Um, it's, it's really pretty uh, robust on the different features it has. So I'd recommend that if any of you don't have it, you can again go to, um, uh, uh, it's called the Retirement Analysis Kit Track Software. Very, very good point. I, I think another key point too is, uh, as I had mentioned, Somebody state retirement, I mean, that's going to come up with every single person that you meet with. They're going to have some questions on it. And we all know, and I think that's one of the neat things about this business is there's always more to learn, right? There's always new stuff that you can, you can come across and learn. But one of the things that you, you need to make sure of is that you've got a good understanding of how it works because you're going to get those questions. And it, it's one thing when you're meeting with somebody and, and we've, all, we've all done this in an appointment where it's, you know, that's a good question I want to check right? Somebody's not going to think much of that. But if you haven't yeah. educated yourself on the state retirement systems and every question they're asking is, good question, let me check, that doesn't instill a lot of confidence. And so it's important when you're running these things to make sure to spend some time and educate yourself on them. So going into that, we know that for a lot of these people, they they are concerned about what their income amount is, right? And so, you know, part of what we want to do is, you know, we want to close business. We want to write something. We want to help these people accomplish their retirement objectives. And so oftentimes that comes with additional planning or sales opportunities, right? So let's say that we're using just a traditional pension review um, uh, format for the uh, appointment. So Sterling said on advertisement, saying something along the lines of, do you know how much income your 403B account is going to generate when you retire? If you're not sure what that answer is, and you'd like to meet with somebody to talk about that, then you can. Well, how do we pivot off of, we've given them an answer on, here's what the income amount is. What is that process for moving over? And, and Scott, maybe you can speak to this. I know we've got a couple of examples coming up here, but maybe speak a, a little bit about maybe how you gauge this or the importance of this for success in the program. Sure. So, you know, one thing that's important is no matter what question the, um, the lead initially is going to ask you, you need to obviously pay attention to that question because it's important to them. But what you have to do is transition that question into something like saying, you know, what you really should be asking me is, you know, if they have a question, I'm, I'm concerned about running out of money every time or time. Great. And that's a valid question and, you know, it's very important, but really the question you should be asking me is that, you know, how do I make sure to pay as few taxes as I possibly can to make my money go further in retirement time? And so, you know, you, you have to kind of pivot based on what they say to what their situation is. I mean, obviously if they're, um, you know, if they're two years away from retirement then they're in their sixties, then you don't want to start talking about taxes because they might not qualify for, uh, you know, the universal life policy. Um, so you have to kind of gauge that and start trying to uncover what it is that's going to be important in the opportunity. It's not just a one size fits all. So you're going to have to gauge your retirement or gauge your, the lead that you're talking to based on the situation they give you. Uh, that's a very good point. 
Uh, and that's the important of ask, importance of asking questions and listening and using that as your 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 framing how to move forward with a prospect. And so we'll we'll go ahead and pull a, a couple of these up and and talk about them, but they're just there's some common ways to pivot in a conversation to get down a planning conversation. So one example of that is the mortgage analogy and uh, we've got a couple of different ways that you can tee up uh, tax discussions and the impact of taxation. We know that that's a very big topic right now uh, from a consumer standpoint. Um, but one way is to ask that individual, would you, would you ever buy a house and not know what the interest rate is on the mortgage? That knee-jerk response from that individual is going to be, well, no. And so then when you ask the question, well, why? Well, because I wouldn't know how much my mortgage payment is. I wouldn't know how much interest I, I would pay. I would never do that. I want to know how much interest I'm going to pay. Okay. Well, when it comes to taxes in retirement, do you have any idea what taxes are going to be 10, 20, 30 years down the road? Simple answer is no. I mean, they're either going to be higher, they're going to be the same, or they're going to be lower, but we don't know what it's going to be. So then that's where you ask that client, well, then isn't that kind of what you're doing with your 403B account? You're putting money on a tax deferred basis into that account and you have no idea what's gonna be taken out in taxes down the road. And for most people, the, the biggest assets they have are their home and their retirement accounts. So if you wouldn't do it with your home, why would you do that with your retirement account? But the great thing about the that type of an analogy is that when you're deployed, when you when deployed done correctly, you get this nice visceral knee-jerk emotional response of, well, no, of course I wouldn't buy a house and not know what the interest rate is on the mortgage. I have no idea what I was going to pay. It makes absolute common sense that pe people realize that, but they don't think about it when it comes to how they're saving for retirement. And so that's a a simple way to get them thinking and get into that uh, conversation and pivot uh, off of that income amount. Um, Scott, can you talk a little bit about uh, some additional ways to approach the tax discussion? Sure. So, you know, taxes are something that is difficult for people to understand. Um, you know, when and when having the discussion, I'll ask people, so, you know, I'm sure you know the number, but, you know, how much is your car payment every month? How much is your house payment every month? And, you know, most of the time they know that number. And I'll say, you know, how much do you pay in taxes every month out of your paycheck? And you know, 90, 99% of the time, no one can tell me that number. And, I, you know, what you follow that up with saying, well, you know, the reason why that is is because it just comes out of your check before you even think about it. So, you know, do you realize how much you have to actually earn to take home $100 these days? And, of course, the answer is almost always no. But what you say is that, you know, if you're in the 24% tax bracket, which a lot of married couples are, you actually have to earn $132 and you're going to pay $32 in taxes for you to actually get that $100 for you to spend. So think about that. For every $100 that you spend, you actually have to make $132 for you to get that money to be able to do so. So that kind of frames the taxation discussion. So what you're doing is you're trying to get them to think a little bit differently about how taxes work. And so whether they you're trying to push them to a universal life sale to talk about you know taxation and how um, you know the the, we're going back to what Curtis just mentioned about the, the um, about the mortgage. Um, you know, it's it's a good way to for, for you to frame it that way, so that way you can kind of push the discussion down that road. Now, if they're not going to qualify for universal life policy, or they're um, you know whatever situations whatever their situation is where that doesn't work, then what you can do is you can still frame it different to say, okay, still what you need to do is whether it's through a Roth style program or through um, you know, an IRA, a 403B, 401K, 457, whatever the case might be that you, what tax deduction you might have, you need to think about that because now what you can do is you can actually save $132 into your tax deferred program. You're going to pay $32 less in taxes, so your take-home pay is going to go down by exactly $100. And so by framing it all that way, what you're doing is you're getting them to think about the taxes more than they would before rather than just oh, I'm just putting $100 away. Well, really, no, you're not. You're putting $132 away, and it's only going to cost you 100 
So it really helps that discussion. And then it, again, if you're going on the universal Excel, then you can go back all the way further and say, look, you know, for you, you um, you know, eliminate the tax on this. So for you to actually earn a hundred, you know, hundred dollars, all it takes is you to earn a hundred dollars because there's no, there's no taxation on this money. Well, very, very good point. Uh, you know, and and that's the thing too is is taxes of taxes in retirement. I mean, that has always eroded income in retirement, but it it really has started to become at the forefront uh, for most individuals. And and part of part of what you have to accomplish is is kind of the educational process of getting people to rethink how they've always thought taxes played a role in when it comes to retirement. Um, so income planning discussion. So, you know, we've, we've met with the individual, they want to know what their income is off of the account. And so we've provided that to them. How do we pivot into the income planning discussion? So the best way to approach this is again, once you've done with the taxes, is just to talk about, you know, how much that they can afford. Uh, the reason why I like to go there during this part of the conversation is if they're saving money or if you find other assets out there, then it gets, starts to get them thinking about that the amount of money that they have accumulated really is irrelevant because it matters about how much money they can take out on a monthly basis and not run out of money. So your goal here is to start framing the conversation around that um, because truly, you know, um, you know, it used to be, well, gosh, if I can get to seven figures, I'll be set. Or if I can get to, you know, half a million dollars, I'll be set. Or, you know, everyone kind of has a number in their mind. But what you've got to do is got to get them off that thinking process and think, well, I just need to think about monthly. How much can I get monthly to make sure that I can pay all my bills and still live, live the lifestyle that I want to live? And so your job as, is to frame it that way, to make them think that way, instead of thinking of just a number. So truly you're doing income planning, not accumulation planning, if that makes sense. But no, that's a, that's a that's a very good point. And you know, another uh, way that we've seen work as well is when you're you're talking to that person and you you've given them their their income number off of their you know state pension, what have you. <clears throat> um, one thing to ask them is, are you planning on living off of this income? Is is this your sole source of income? Uh, and this is particularly a question too when you know that they're married, um, because chances are their spouse has a 401k or some other type of account as well. And so typically the answer is going to be no. We have been putting money in here and there and what have you. Well, that's where you can make the point that okay, well, like most people, most people have multiple sources of income that they count on to make up their retirement income. And so what I would tell you is just with this one account that we've been looking at, whether it's more than we think or the same as what we're taking a look at, it's really irrelevant because if you're planning on having multiple sources of income in retirement, they've all got to be working the right way in order for you to have the kind of retirement that you want. So that means we really need to take a look at everything because th this one account is not going to make or break your retirement. It's all of them together. And so that's a, that's another good way to get them to think kind of on that bigger scale and open that door to start talking about the other accounts that they might have. So um, paper app or e-app. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, they, they like a three appointment format. Um, a lot of, a lot of people work off of a three appointment format, but one of the things that we found with this type of a system is there certainly an opportunity to do um, applications in the second appointment? And so I, I guess this is kind of a, a dual prong question, Scott. So first off, should we be looking at using a paper app or an e-app? And then should we be even trying to get to the point of an application in the second appointment? Great question. So to answer your first question, for sure you should be using an e-app. It's so much simpler. It, the issue rates are so much better. They, um, um, the not in good order standings go way down uh, with an e-app. Uh, plus, uh, with Firelight and also with uh, iPipeline, uh, what you can do is you can get the application all set up in advance. 
And then once if the in the second appointment, if it does transition to that, then you can have it available and pull it up. Uh, if you need to have it ready for the third appointment, then it's ready for the third appointment. So I would recommend always having the e app uh, up and ready for you. Plus with Zoom, uh, what you can do is you can turn over control of the screen to the client and then they can actually click and sign right then and there in front of you. So it makes it a lot easier that, that way you don't have to email the application to them, things of that nature. So I would strongly suggest to use the app. When it comes to doing it for the second or third appointment, I've always tried to get the appointment, get the app in the second appointment. And, um, you know, even if it does take getting the third appointment, still mentally they have purchased at that point. So, you know, if I'm taking a life app, then what I'll say is, okay, this is going to take you a little while to get qualified. Let's see if we can get you qualified. Let me ask you some health questions. And I roll right into the application straight from there. And before they even realize it, you know, they're answering the questions and, and kind of going through the whole process. Um, you know, same thing if you're taking an annuity application, um, you know, roll, roll right into it. But this takes a little while for us to get going. So let's go ahead and get the paperwork started here. And then, you know, obviously, if you need a third appointment, you can schedule a third appointment at that time, get the rest of the paperwork to set them up for what, up, what else is going to happen. So to answer your question, yes, I would strongly recommend using the e-app. Um, I would have it ready for the second appointment and try to get it on the second appointment if you can, just to solidify that third appointment. Um, but if you have to take it on the third appointment, then that works too. Yeah. Well, I think a big part too is 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 to not feel like is not feel like if, if there's multiple uh, issues that you uncover when you're meeting with this individual, don't feel like you've got to get to a point where here's how we solve everything all together and we're going to do it all at once, right? You know, if you've identified multiple planning opportunities, um, that's where when we're talking about, you know, doing an e-app in the second or third appointment, maybe it's okay. So, you know, we've identified a, B, C is planning opportunities. Let's go ahead and start with getting A addressed. Let's get that sorted out. And then we're gonna move on to B, C, et cetera. And then at the end of this process, we'll address all the challenges that you have. But um, you know, part of that's gonna be that individual, right? And uh, when you're meeting with them on, do they want to get to a point where they're just trying to solve everything all at once or do they prefer the idea of, okay, well, yeah, let's get this thing crossed off the list and then get to the next one, the next one. So that kind of takes us into uh, the, the last question that we have, which is setting the stage for next appointment. So let, let's say in this scenario, Scott, you know, we meet with the person on the second appointment. Uh, we know they're not necessarily due for an application or maybe, you know, we had some things that they brought up during the appointment that makes us feel like, okay, we need to go meet for uh, a, a third meeting. Can you talk a little bit about how you, in the second appointment, set the stage for the third? You bet. So just like in the first appointment, um, just to recap a little bit, in the first appointment, you always want to, you know, make sure that they, that they know that you're going to put something together for them. You're going to do work on their behalf and that you will be presenting that work that you do in the next appointment. Same applies for the second to the third. You always got to make sure that they know that they're coming back for something. And so um, it can be something as simple as, you know, we need to set the third appointment so that we can talk about what the next steps are. People like to know kind of what's going to happen next. Um, you know, we need to set the third appointment so that we can make sure. And, you know, if you don't have time to take the application in a second, so you can go through and say, OK, we're going to take the third appointment so we can make sure to that you're going to qualify for this or that uh, we can get all the information we need to uh, you know to make this as smooth as possible whatever the case might be you need to make sure and throw a hook out there so that they know that the third appointment is necessary and they need to be on it so set some kind of a sense of urgency if you will also be careful on any of these appointments don't set them too far out um, you know we could get guys who are you know scheduling two and three weeks out and they're wondering why their no show rates so high on the on the second and third appointment you really got to hit them pretty close together if you can. I mean, obviously, there's always going to be factors that come in, whether they go on vacation or you got spring break coming up here, um, you know, whatever the case might be. But for the most part, if you can get an appointment done within, you know, five to 10 days, that's really the uh, from start to finish. That's really the ideal. Um, so don't try to spread it out too far. 
Um, so when you're scheduling the second and third appointments, make them for second, you know, two to three days out to give them time to get their stuff together. Um, but, you know, for sure, don't be setting them for weeks out because uh, they'll forget. Um, also, setting this, as far as setting the stage for the third appointment is um, you want, might want to kind of throw it out there that on the third appointment that you're going to be asking for referrals. So what I always say is that, um, you know, kind of in, in closing the conversation is, is that, um, gosh, it's been really helpful. It's been really great for me to, uh, you know, provide for you the help that I've been able to, um, you know, if only we had, you know, gotten to do this earlier. And so what that does is it kind of gives them a chance to think about, you know, who is it that I can help out that maybe um, that, you know, could, could benefit from this earlier on in their career than what you were able to, or if it is early on, who do you know that's coming into this career just like you are? And so it's always good to set up referrals in the second appointment that you're going to be asking for in the third. No, that's a good point. And, and I think a, a key theme uh, with all this, as, you, as you've mentioned, is them understanding that this is a process and what to expect the next time that they're meeting with you. So they've got a reason to meet with you. Um, I, I think the other point, uh, and I know you mentioned this uh, a couple of times in the first training, is anytime you're setting an appointment, set it when you're in the current appointment, right? Don't ever wrap up the appointment and tell them, okay, I'll, let me check my schedule. I'll reach out to you um, uh, to get the next appointment on the books. You want to try and do that when you're actually meeting with them right there, right? That's a good point. And how you say that is, is that my calendar is booking up. So if they won't give you a date to say, let's just set something tentative for right now, just so I can hold the place open. And what that does is that tells them that you're very busy and they need to do business with you because no one wants to do business with someone who has all the time in the world in their hands. So um, those phrases are very, very important. So all you gotta do is say, um, yeah, my appointment is, my, my calendar is booking up. Uh, so no matter what, let's just get something tentative on the book so I can at least reserve a spot for you. What do you think would be the best date for you? Very good point, very good point. So, um, so this covers the uh, best practices for the uh, second appointment in this process. Um, uh, what we will have coming up is part three, uh, where we talk about the third appointment. And some of the topics that we'll cover in that training are, uh, Scott had mentioned uh, income planning software like Track and Retirement Analyzer, uh, Stonewood's another option to take a look at as well. So we'll talk a little bit about incorporating that in as well as how to ask for, for referrals uh, in that appointment. So um, be on the lookout for that. And uh, if you guys have additional questions, certainly uh, reach out, talk to one of the sales directors over here at IMS. We're here to help you as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, for, for those of you that maybe uh, aren't currently in the program and are interested in doing it, one of the things that's provided is an onboarding process to get everything synced up, set up with your calendar, and, and chat through some best practices as well. So uh, with that, Scott, I appreciate you taking some time today to go through this and, and do a deep dive on the second appointment. And I appreciate everybody else taking the time to be with us today as well. So hope everybody has a good rest of the day and uh, an amazing week. Thanks. Thank you, Curtis.